Words West, Voices of Young Pioneers, written by Ginger Wadsworth, Part 3. Each night, the captain, with the help of the scout, would form his wagon group into a wagon circle for protection, and then everyone would eat inside their evening meal. It was a lively scene with pitch tents of every size, shape, and color. There were campfires, animals, and people busy at work. Rifles, saddles, harnesses, trunks, and all other kinds of gear lay on the ground. People were talking and singing, laughing and whistling. A few might be arguing or even cursing their oxen as they checked on them one last time for the night. To the sound of the harmonica or fiddle, families chatted around the campfire and immigrants began to settle in for the night. Women and children slept inside the wagons or tents. The men and the drivers bedded down under the wagons or near the still warm campfire. On cold nights, a buffalo robe or a blanket covered the snoring traveler. Mary Burrell, a teenager from Illinois, wrote, Always sleep sound no matter how much noise is going on. During the early weeks, the weather was generally good. It gave the greenhorns, shopkeepers, doctors, and other non-farmers who didn't have much experience with mules or oxen, time to learn how to handle them. Frisky young animals that had been bought at the jumping off spot began to settle in to the daily job of pulling the wagon. Sundays were also a day of rest for the animals. In addition to the oxen team's family usually brought milk cows and several saddle horses. Large herds grazed two or three miles away from the camp and were guarded by several men and young boys. As one traveler said, our lives depend on our animals. Boys helped their fathers mend harnesses and wagon parts. To keep the wooden wheels from drying out too much, they greased them with boot leather oil, soap, and even bacon fat. The men painted gutta percha, a kind of rubber, on the canvas covers to keep them waterproof. They checked the wooden parts for damage, including the hickory boughs that held the canvas's shape. It was also important to clean their guns. They might not fire properly if they were damp or starting to rust inside. After a rainstorm, women dried out the bedding boxes and barrels. Each woman opened her flour, coffee, sugar, and salt containers to the dry air. Children helped their mothers sort the mold, sort out the moldy rice, beans, and cornmeal, and the dried out fruit from the fresh. 18-year-old Eugenia Zeber, who was going to Oregon, kept a diary during her trip. She remembered one particular Sunday when the wagon train camped next to a river. We have a most lovely place to wash, good water for washing close at hand, and we are shaded by trees, and there are bushes nearby on which we can spread our clothes. The water looks so tempting, how pleasant it would be to go in wading. Another young pioneer, Lucy, did go in swimming. Ma and I have just been in the Sweetwater River, but oh, it was cold. We could only take two or three dips, and then we'd run out. Clothes dried in the sun, but if the wagon train moved on too soon, a mother wrote that we wore them just as they dried. We were not particular about our looks. Many pioneers had packed trunks of clothing, but within a shoe, few short weeks, they discovered it was simpler to slip, just slip on the same outfit every day, even if it was dirty. Back home, women and girls had dressed in floor-length dresses with petticoats under their skirts. For women and teenage girls, though, having long, narrow waists was fashionable, even if it meant wearing a tight corset. Eliza Ann McCauley and a few other women switched to bloomer outfits, shorter skirts worn over pants that reached the shoe tops. It was a very radical style back in those days, but it was awfully practical out on the prairie. Although bloomer outfits were popular with some women on the trail, many thought the outfits were too extreme. Most men and boys simply wore pants or cotton or flannel shirts but some adopted the style of the mountain men dressed in animal skins. 
Children walked barefoot, and their feet grew tough. Later, when the ground turned rocky, they would wear homespun shoes of leather. There were no right or left shoes at that time. A pair was put on, soaked in water, and allowed to dry on the wearer's feet. Younger children might inherit an outgrown pair of shoes from an older brother or sister, or they traded for moccasins with the Indians. Six or seven days a week, wagon trains headed west. Many journal writers noted that the scenery was boring in the beginning with the never-changing open space and tall grass. It was easy at first, but farther into the trip, unpredictable events seemed to break up the daily routine. As Rachel Taylor wrote in her journal on the way to Oregon, we were delayed in the morning as a new ox yoke had broken and we had to build a new one to replace it. And two weeks later, she noted that the train did not start until late, as a broken wagon wheel had to be repaired. In another diary entry, Eugenia Zeber wrote, We camped out and slept in our tent. We had very pleasant weather generally, and were all in good spirits enjoying ourselves. Eugenia was writing about her parents as well as her three younger sisters, and little brother. A few weeks into the trip they had to stop unexpectedly because as they crossed a ditch a chain connecting the horses broke. Much to their surprise it was snowing and the wind was blowing hard. As they pulled the wagon from the ditch, repaired the chain, and then hitched up the horses again, they finally started on. After supper it usually took travelers a while to settle down for the night. In the big wagon trains, it was especially hard to keep all the animals in one place, even with guards watching over them. A few might wander off in search of better grass or fresh water, or a sudden thunderstorm might cause them to stampede and run for miles. The men and boys could use up a half a day or longer just trying to round them all up. Although wagon trains hoped to go about 15 or 20 miles a day, this seldom happened. Lost animals or children, mud, time-consuming river crossings, childbirth, numerous other events caused delays. Some days, they never moved at all. Pioneers camped near Independence Rock before moving on. They wrote or carved their names on this very famous landmark. When Helen Carpenter explored the large, loaf-shaped rock, she wrote, Saw several names up high on the sides and placed mine there, writing it with tar. Elisha Brooks added his name. Charlie True, who had come from Minnesota, didn't, but he noted that there were hundreds and hundreds of names done in lamp black, in oil, axle grease, paint, anything that could be daubed on the rock. It was here we found the names of J.C. Fremont, Brigham Young, Kit Carson, and many other early pioneers. Beyond Independence Rock, pioneers passed Devil's Gate, another famous landmark. The trail was rough. They began the slow ascent of the Rocky Mountains through barren land dotted with sagebrush and greasewood. This stretch of the trip tested the tempers of men and the energies of animals, Sarah Cummings recalled in her journal. It had been months since her family had left Missouri. Wits cracked and language turned colorful. Sarah said that her dear mother would almost inevitably say, you go on ahead, so she would be out of earshot of the men and the horses. Later in earlier July or August, they reached a wide open valley in the Rocky Mountains called South Pass. It was crested on the Continental Divide, 7,000 feet above sea level. The ascent was so gradual that some pioneers didn't realize they had reached the backbone of the Rocky Mountains. South Pass was a familiar spot to the old mountain men who are now guiding the wagon trains. Ahead of the travelers, the creeks and the rivers now flowed toward Oregon and the Pacific Ocean, 
and behind them all the waters flowed eastward in the direction of their former homes. The mountain air was cold and the peaks gleamed white with snow. At the high altitude, snow might be falling even during summer. A young pioneer wrote that she gathered snow for a snowball. The ground would freeze overnight. One man who slept outside discovered upon waking that his hair being very long and the ends frozen to the ground so that I had to pull it loose but would leave some behind for the wolves to examine. It was hard going in what is now present day Idaho. Travelers splashed through creeks and followed faint Indian and animal trails along the Snake River. They climbed over the Blue Mountains in what is now eastern Oregon, and that was also difficult. Everyone was tired, and the animals were weak from the long journey. The forest was damp and cold, especially at night. In the early years, there was no road over the Cascade Mountains leading into Oregon. Using the tools they brought with them from home, immigrants built large wooden boats or log rafts near the Columbia River at the Dalles, which means rapids at the site. Sometimes they left their wagons behind or took the wheels off and set the wagon on a bed of the raft. The animals were sold at Fort Walla Walla. The pioneers planned to purchase fresh animals at Fort Vancouver after the water part of their journey. Jesse wrote that the faithful oxen, now sore-necked and sore-footed, had marched week after week, month after month, drawing those wagons with their loads from the Missouri River all the way now to the Columbia and were unhitched for the last time. It was a scary trip down the Columbia River. Boats had to go over rapid after rapid. The Applegate family used two boats. Jesse recalled going around a bend in the river and seeing the rapids ahead. There was a wail of anguish anguish, a shriek, a scene of confusion. The boats we were watching disappear, and we saw the men and boys struggling in the water. Warren, Jesse's older brother, was never seen again. Another Oregon-bound traveler filled the bed of a covered wagon with soil and planted apple, pear, plum, and cherry trees. The trees were three to five feet high. Everyone teased the farmer, but he got his young orchard across the plains. After wrapping the trees and roots carefully, the pioneer and his nursery floated down the Columbia River. Many of those trees in his wagon became the beginning stock for today's orchards in the Willamette Valley. The Barlow Road over the mountains was completed in 1846 and settlers no longer needed to risk life-threatening river travel, but there were still creeks and smaller rivers they had to ford. They were hard on wagons and people. Sarah Cummins helped by riding her horse ahead. This is what she put in her journal. I would ride ahead in the stream, especially if it would become treacherous. I would look for hidden rocks. I would ride in front and point to where the hidden rocks were so that the boats could avoid them. The Oregon Trail finally ended in Oregon City. Some pioneers, like the Applegate family, veered south to settle in the Willamette River Valley area, and they could think about farming and beginning their life once again. The End